Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the enormous honor and pleasure of chatting across the world with bassist Moini Day. Moini, how are you today? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. How are you? Oh, doing fabulous. Thank you so much for spending time with us and taking time to chat. Starting from the beginning, as we always like to know, we'd like to know a little bit about your musical journey. How did you get started in music and particularly on bass? I think by now everybody knows how I got started on bass. It's because of my father. Mm -hmm. My father is a bass player and my mom's a singer and uh, she doesn't sing anymore. But back in the days, she used to do a lot of backing uh, vocal sessions for movies, jingles, you know. And uh, so did my dad. He played bass for movies and he had his own band and I would travel with him everywhere, bunk my school days and go tag along with him everywhere he goes. And yeah, I always wanted to actually become a fashion designer. And I had a lot of interest towards creative things, just like painting, uh, colors, glitter. Those are the things made me really happy. Those things made me really happy. And I wanted to do something in life that kind of connected all to colors, mm -hmm. you know. So I started painting. I started painting first. I started drawing, sketching. I would literally be able to copy anything. I would be able to sketch you when I was like, seven years old, eight years old, and wow. I was able to do that. And I would get first prize in my school for drawing competitions and stuff. And it just, the interest kind of just built further ahead and made me realize that, oh, I actually like colors. And I, I just, I'm not like solely dedicated to just painting and drawing. I like interior designing too. I like anything that's got to do something with creativity or creation, you know. Then I developed interest for stitching clothes. So then I started stitching clothes and designing my own outfits. And during this whole process, my dad always had this idea of having two kids <laughs> and he wanted one to be a bass player and one to be a drummer. No. My sister was learning drums as a kid growing up, but then she developed interest for guitar and then she started learning guitar. I, on the other hand, I never wanted to learn bass, but because dad wanted me to, I was just <laughs> doing it on the side with my extracurricular activities in school, along with my private classes, tuition homework, with school homework. It was a, oh my God, it was like, it was a, all those days I will never forget because I would wake up 5 a.m. in the morning and my day would end at 12 a.m. and then next day again, 5 a.m. you wake up like every day was that, you know? And no matter how late it is in the night, no matter how late my dad is coming back from his gigs, he would always make sure he gives me lessons on the bass, you know? Wow. And he makes sure that I practice, you know? My days were occupied, man. Like, it was... Yeah, there was no playing time. It was only music. It was studies. Sometimes, you know, playing playing badminton with dad or playing carom with mm. dad, you know, indoor activities more because my dad obviously didn't want me to get uh, distracted with boys and, you know, going out to movies mm. and hanging out with you know, when you're a teenager, you, you tend to do those things and sure. it, it can, you can get distracted. I'm not saying that's bad. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that my family was strict and yeah. I was not allowed to. So, <laughs> so because I was not allowed to, I spent a lot of time with myself in the house mm -hmm. and I would find ways to keep myself happy. So like stitching, drawing, anything to do with glitter, glue, you know, uh, just sticking stuff. Yeah, just... I was just enjoying my life as a kid with whatever things I had at, at my place, at my parents' place, when I used to live with them. And then I think it just organically kind of happened that guitars were hanging on the walls and I started to play with them. And because my father was teaching me, I started to develop more interest towards music and I started to realize that, oh, I actually like this kind of music more than mm -hmm. this, you know? Then I would listen to more bands with that type of genre that I personally love. And then my dad would introduce me to different types of musicians. We didn't have no internet that time. So sure. remember, like, we were talking cassettes. We would listen to music 
on cassette players mm -hmm. and like CD players, you know, you have the like disc players yeah. and DVD players that came much later. But yeah, we, we would listen to music and start watching videos on DVD players. And that's how I got introduced to Jaco Pastorius. And my dad told me all about him and I developed interest to know more about Jaco and how he's doing things on the bass and that he was the only one to play the bass like that in his times. Mm -hmm. And that was really fascinating to me. As So I started learning bass at the age of three, by the way. Like, wow. My first exercise was when I was three years old. My dad saw that I could tap the right tempo at the age of three when he would practice his bass at home. Mm -hmm. And that like gave him more assurance that, oh, she, she already got the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, now only God knows where she's going to go, you know. <laughs> so I already had the time inside my system and... Some things are just in the DNA when you're growing up in a musical environment that's just bound to be, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, slowly with days passing by, I practiced harder, developed interest, like I said, and then started playing with a lot of musicians to sum up the whole thing. In short, I just started becoming successful, more successful day by day by playing with many more artists. Mm -hmm. The first musician that I played with was Ranjit Barrett, who is now John McLaughlin's drummer. And he's like my second father because he, you know, taught me a lot of things. The way I talk, the way I walk, the way I deal with things, my outlook, my personality, I think 50% comes from Ranjit Uncle because I have hung out with him so much and he would bring in all these international artists in his studio that I would hang out with as a kid, you know, coming mm -hmm. back from school and going to his studio and just hanging out with them and playing with them. It, it gave me the real world experience, you know, instead of going to like a school and them sitting you down and giving you like a lecture on theory and stuff. For me, it was just like, it was very natural. It naturally happened because I was playing with so many musicians organically. And then I started gigging with Ranjit Akul. I think my first gig was when I was 10 years old. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it all happened. That, that, is, that is quite the story. So in addition to all of that exposure, have you ever done any other formal studies? Or maybe you haven't needed to? Never. Really. My father... Father uh, wanted me to learn to read and write because he couldn't. Mm -hmm. He could he couldn't sight read, but he wanted me to be able to sight read because he wanted me to go to that international level. And so he was borrowing books from his mm -hmm. friends and bringing them home, like Trinity books or Berkeley books or MI books. And he would tell me to you know do these studies, and if you want to go to somebody's place, go and you know uh, have the learning have somebody teach you do this because you will need to do this when you're all grown up. And so, yeah, I, I would go to musicians' houses and uh, they would teach me. And they, by, I mean, for my age, I was already very, very advanced when it came to technique and playing. Mm -hmm. But the other aspect I wanted to get stronger at was reading and writing. So that came through just, um, I guess, just... Um, organically just hanging out with musicians who could do that and seeing them read and write made me ask questions and in, re in result I got better you know got you well all of that exposure certainly has given you a very wide gamma of potential and stuff that you play because you've got ragats funk fusion metal I mean I don't yeah. I don't think there's anything I haven't heard you play <laughs> Carnatic music, Konako. Yeah. Yeah, deep funk. My, that's my favorite. And then, of course, jazz and pop, R&B. I can't think of anything that I haven't done so far. <laughs> well, and it's great, especially because you've got you've had the influences of both the, the rest of the world, but with yeah. with what you've experienced in India, you mentioned the the, the Konako. That was something I experienced with John McLaughlin. He was kind right. of on his farewell tour here. And it was so fascinating because I noticed that a band member was doing stuff with his hands while they yeah. were uh, using a, like a takika, taki, takika. And I'm like, oh, what's, what's happening here? And, yeah. and, and, and you do that too. But that, that comes from Southern India, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's right. 
Yeah, but there are two different. There are there are different types of karana. So there is Karnataka, and then there is Hindustani. Mm -hmm. Um. So and then there is North and South to that as well. There are subdivisions. So some of the syllables are different. So instead of taka takita, which is five beats, um, in a different karana, it would be tadigenadun. That's also five, but it's the syllables are different. Wow. So, yeah. It is so fascinating, and so not not only is there this huge diversity of tempos and time signatures again in yes. in western music so so often it's all four four and don't don't do anything outside very of that scared to, very scared to play any polyrhythmic structures oh. let's not go to seven and a half or eleven and a half <laughs> it's unheard of well and not to mention the same thing also with tonalities because we, we kind of stick with the standard you know a b c d e f g but in the rest of the world, a lot of times they'll go half tones and, and yeah, quarter tones and other things yeah, in I between. The language is music, but the way people approach it in different parts of the world is different mm -hmm. because they learned it that way, right? When I was growing up here, I learned more about Konako. I learned more about, you know, the way people, the process, the system of making music here, whereas it's completely different in the West. When you go to the U.S., you know, they will usually give you a sheet of music and then have you read that and yeah. play, you know, or if you're lucky, then you get music sent to you and then you learn it and you play, you know, mm -hmm. which is cool. But the way they make music and we make music is very different. Yes. Um, you know, and having said that, I think that's what makes me different from other bass players because I, like you said, I have the versatility. Mm -hmm. I have uh, little bits of everything and I'm able to infuse that in whatever setup or lineup that I'm playing in. And that voice is so unique because of my versatile foundation that I've had. Mm -hmm. It's very fascinating for the audience to hear this unique voice that I have, which is they find which they find different to me it's normal because mm. that's just who i am sure a fusion baby i guess <laughs> you could call but i think i'm i'm still evolving and i'm still flourishing and there's so much more that i want to explore and i haven't explored the la side yet and i am yet to explore that side and i cannot wait to hopefully by next month i would be in la playing with musicians there and I want to explore that chapter of my life. And I'm really excited about that because in India, I have played with everybody. Mm -hmm. There's not a single person that I haven't played with. And even though I'm not a part of any band permanently, I have my own band that I gig with. I have my clients that I do recording sessions for, for their albums. Every single day I'm recording for at least minimum three artists, you know. Wow. So I'm busy. Just, but it, the funny part is, being in India, I am busy in my studio doing a lot of recording session work for musicians in LA, Maldives, Singapore, Japan, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just physically present in this country, you know? So I think it's time for me to make this move and see. I'm, I'm excited. I want to see where it takes me. I got you. Well, and it has been such a change. When I talked to some of the older musicians, if they were going to collaborate with somebody in a different part of, let's say even in the country, they would record a track on tape, box it up, ship it to the other person. It would take a few weeks to get there. Then the other person would hear it. Then they would add their track to it and they'd ship it to the next person. And so thanks to the technology, you live at a time where you can have this collaboration worldwide. Yeah, time's flying because of this technology. It's made our life so much easier. At the same time, also hard in some ways because time is moving so fast. Technology is also advancing day by day. Every single day there is a new thing mm -hmm. that you have to learn to do something, mm -hmm. you know. And with times moving by, I'll, I always say this, with, with times moving so fast, you've got to keep yourself updated. True. Otherwise, there will be somebody who is more advanced and will take your place because mm -hmm. there are amazing musicians out there. So if you don't keep yourself updated with time moving so fast, then you will be left behind, you know? Absolutely. And I think especially in the times of the pandemic, it has forced a lot of musicians to acquire 
some more studio skills and recording skills, things that they didn't That's have right. before. Yeah. Or they just would walk in, in into a studio, let the engineer do the recording right. part, then walk out, I mean, and it was it, easy. The feeling of that is nothing like you know, it's nowhere close to what we do in the studio just us recording in front of the laptop and then doing a video shoot and put setting up camera setting up light and mm -hmm. setting up background setting up sound you are your own engineer there's a lot of responsibilities on you when you're doing it from your own place and like you said it has taught a lot of musicians i was already doing this because i was doing youtube so yeah. i was pretty veteran uh, i would say and now it has made me do even more make even more videos, make even more content than usual because you have so much time, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah, I think it's great. I think it was it was a good time for people to realize that no thing is a small thing because a lot of people in normal times would be like, oh yeah, I'm just doing a simple wedding show. Mm -hmm. And now it's like any show is good show. Sure. Just give me a show, yeah. <laughs> you know? So... I think those people now have learned to value those small things that they, you know, said even more. I got you. And so as we look at your music, what is your creative process to come up with your bass lines? How, how do you approach that? Uh, there, there's no specific way that I do it. There is no formula to mm -hmm. it. It just naturally comes to my mind, I guess. But if, Say, for example, I'm struggling to find a good groove, then I would listen to the cake pattern that's okay. happening. And usually the pattern is in the cake. And then you kind of fill in the gaps based on your liking. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you got to listen to the melody. And I feel like I've always believed that the groove is already there in the song. You just got to find it, mm -hmm. you know. And when you find it, you will know there is a certain type of satisfactory feeling you will get inside. You will know, okay, that's that's the one, you know? At least that, hap th that happens with me, mostly. Okay. Um, all the clients that I work for, if I find something that's magical and feels satisfactory to me, I will lay it down no matter what. Even though the client has said, don't do that, you know, I will still lay it down <laughs> and I'll provide it as an option. And you know what? 99% of the times they have liked it and they have used that over mm -hmm. the thing that they wanted, mm -hmm. you know? So like just um, a day ago, I was talking to a client and I was like, hey, you know what would be cool is to reharmonize that part because it's repeating here and it's the same thing. Do you want me to do the same thing? And he's like, yeah, that's a great idea actually. I think some cool chords, jazzy chords here would be great. So most of my clients right now, that I have, they're not only wanting me to play bass, but also rearrange. Oh, Just wow. recently, I composed a song for this guy, I can't remember, but Chad Smith, it's Chad Smith from Red, Red Hot Chili Peppers, okay. played drums. And I arranged the song, produced the song, composed the song, and I had my husband play horns on it, and it's gonna come out very soon. There are lots of other musicians on that album, like Hajin Farad, um, can't remember the names, but but yeah, like that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of people, they come up to me nowadays, and they not only want my bass skills, but also want my creative skills. What I'm thinking, you know, they want to have that on their song, and I'm I'm happy about that because I do that. I feel like I do that the best, and I am more of a um, arranger and more of a director. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, even when it comes to my bass parts, like if you listen to my bass parts, they're very well orchestrated. And there is a story, there is a certain intention that goes behind creating this story. So yeah, I think I like where this journey is taking me. I think it's taking me to the path where it's going to make me a music director or a you know, maybe a composer where I will be able to hire musicians one day. I'm actually going to be doing uh, music direction and composing for one of the South Indian movies very soon. So this is going to be my first movie as a composer. So I'm excited. Very cool. Well, in a way, it's all, you're almost like you used to do your art. You're adding glitter to the music that they've yeah. already given you to make it yeah. shine and, and make it stand out more. So that is very yeah. creative. Yeah, I've always said that I like to flow like a river and I feel like 
if you are open minded like that then the more accepting you become of your environment and mm-hmm. you don't differentiate between oh that's that oh that's big oh that's small oh that's okay you know if it excites you it excites you mm-hmm. you know and at the end of the day it all comes down to the product that you're delivering so if it's good people will hear it no matter what absolutely and since we're talking about sound we should talk about how you get your sound what gear are you playing on so uh as you can see i have a lot of <laughs> cabinets i have some more behind this camera as yeah. well there are there are two more four by ten cabs mm-hmm. and this is a two by ten cab mm-hmm. by mark base this is the classic vintage model that they have discontinued but I wanted this so they were very kind to send me this one <laughs> even after they discontinued it so I love Mark Bass they love me so much and I love them so much I've never played this live but this is like one of those secret babies that you know everybody loves to have so mm-hmm. this is that for me and then on the right hand side I don't know if you can see this one yes a little is bit. an 8 by 10 yeah, HF 8, 8 by 10 and then on top is a 4 by 10. Wow. And then behind, like I said, two more 4 by 10s and then there is a combo that I use sometimes if I'm like jamming with my husband. And I have a drum kit here. It's a it's a little jam pad that I have. I have a DB Mark uh, Head Amp 663 and a cabinet, Frank Gambale series. So I, I have my whole band come here and play. Mm-hmm. We all play here. My sound comes from the uh, Little Marcus Thousand Head Amp, but what is interesting is I don't use the head out into my focus right. So I use my my DAW is focus right Scarlet, mm-hmm. uh, the four channel one I use. What I do is I go straight into the focus right and then take uh, that out into my head amp and then the head amp out into the cabinet so i'm hearing just the sound of the output but i'm not li- i'm not taking the sound of the head amp i'm just literally using that so that i can get an output into my head amp mm-hmm. i don't have a left right i've always recorded this way and lately i've been getting a lot of questions about my sound how do you get this unique sound so I'm going to reveal what I do, which is very unusual. And I, I know and I know a lot of engineers would be like, how do you know that the <laughs> output level is good? Mm-hmm. I just know because I've been doing this for years now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, try a letter and yeah. kind of just figure it out. So I use this one as my output speaker okay. when I'm recording. I don't record on my headphones. I like the lively sound. I hear the speaker sound, so I only do this. <laughs> if I do this, then my building people will kick me out of the building, so we won't. We would never do that. <laughs> only this one. Uh-huh. And uh, my laptop is usually here behind me, mm-hmm. and I have an OBB3 preamp built in my bass, and I have Angular pickups on my bass. And that's literally it. I'm going straight. There is no pedal that I use for my sound. It's my raw sound. I go straight into the focus right, out of the focus right, into the head amp. So I'm not using the head amp sound. So there is no compressor. There is no gate. There is no boost, no drive, nothing. It's my bass sound, my finger sound. Here is a little thing. It's, it's, it was a mistake that I grew up playing with, mm-hmm. yeah, but it turned out to be very helpful in my today's days, I would say, because I used to dig in a lot. My, my bass used to have really high action strings. The tension was really high. And so I would have to press a lot harder to get, get a note sound, you know? Mm-hmm. And that made me dig in a lot. And I would spend a lot of stamina and energy trying to get that one note sound because it takes more time and more energy, right? Mm -hmm. And your wrists start hurting after a point because it's really hard on your, I guess, nerves. And they sent me this purple bass that now you guys see me play on all the time. It was actually a demo bass at a store. This guy called Hajime he used to own this bass and he got me this bass just to play for that concert because my bass just stopped working like a few hours before the show was about to start this is after a sound check okay so of course that was a disaster and then you know playing on a new bass that you don't even know like you don't even have a connection that was 
you know, quite difficult. But the moment I touched this base, I saw that the strings were so close to the fretboard, the action was super low. And I was like playing and I felt like I've been playing this bass for years <laughs> and my volume was at, my volume knob was at 20%, but I was getting the volume of 80%. That's because of the mistake that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I was digging in a lot because of my higher action strings. So now I would have to dynamically tell my fingers to lay it down a little bit because it's it, the, the sound, you got the tone, but now because you're at 20%, the sound engineer is getting a lot of gain and a lot of string sound, a lot of the tone, but he needs that uh, brilliance in the sound, mm -hmm. right? So then I dynamically laid back and saved a lot of energy by putting the volume knob up a little bit, let's say 40%. And because of that mistake that I grew up with, my, my sound comes from my fingers because I dig in a lot. Till today, I still you know, play like that. And my volume knob is always at 40 to 50% and never crosses about that. Mm -hmm. Even on my head amp, it's at like 10 o'clock, you know? Matt's 11 o'clock. It doesn't go about that. And I think that's where all of my sound comes from. And then when it comes to the mixing and mastering process, I like to have a little bit of Fab Filter plugin that I really enjoy. And then I like to add a little bit of chorus sometimes. And another one that I really like is the Waves by Dynamics. So those are a few plugins that I like to use sometimes on and off. I got you. Well, we had a, a little bit of a Skype freeze. So when you were talking about your bass, I do want to clarify, you're talking about your mayonnaise bass? Yes, mayonnaise Komodo's Classic 5. That's the model I play. And Mark Bass, I endorse Mark Bass Mayonnaise. Groove Gear is another amazing company. They can make amazing gig bags and fret wraps. Mm -hmm. I use fret wraps myself. Um, and then I use SID strings. And or society strings and providence cables and there's a newer cable company that i'm endorsing now they're called fat cables and lathan basswear and when it comes to pedals if a certain type of music requires me to use a certain type of sound let's say octaver or wah or distortion or you know any 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 specific synth sound then I immediately go to TC Electronic. I endorse TC Electronic and Boss Pedals. So yeah, both the companies have been really nice to me. They have sent me so many pedals. Flashback Delay is one of my favorite ones. Hall of Fame, Brain Waves. Um, I, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah, mm -hmm. the pink one, Brain Waves, and then the Sub and Up Octaver, which gives you a sound like Hammond. And uh, yeah, there are so many cool pedals. I also like this company called Soundblocks. I love their bass envelope filter. There are so many amazing companies out there. But yeah, I'm very grateful and fortunate to have them in my life. And uh, I wouldn't have been able to own these beauties if they were not kind enough to send me these, you know. Well, and with pedals so often, it has so much to do with the kind of music that you're playing whether you need the greater distortion or whether you need, you know, overdrive or, yeah. you know, it can go from extraordinarily simple to extraordinarily complex, but it, it really, you have all of the tools you need to address the music that you're, that you're right. playing. So as we're looking ahead, I know where we are, particularly, there's still a, a lot of uncertainty because of the pandemic, but what plans do you have for the future? I think, uh, I've always said this when people ask me that question, what goals do you have or what plans do you have in mm -hmm. the future? I, I've never had plans in my life. Everything just comes to me and I take it either as a challenge if I like it and then if I don't like it, I am at a position in my life where I can say no. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to say no, but sometimes you mm -hmm. gotta, so you do it. And yeah, I'm very fortunate in my life that I'm able to do what I really want in life. I've never had any goals, to, so to speak. I've just wanted to play music, wanted to write my own music. I've always wanted to gig. I, I just, as a kid growing up, loved the process of getting ready, selecting an outfit, preparing for the show and putting up a show that people have never seen before. That whole process of making a movie-like show with the whole stage production and music production and 
outfits and colors and lights and you know um, LEDs and screen behind projectors all this stuff is just it excites me I want to mm -hmm. explore that more so I think in the future I would love to have dancers in my band where maybe I would dance I would play the bass mm -hmm. and dance and sing you know and yeah I want to have like a horn section a string section maybe two drummers a guitar player and uh, yeah that's that's a dream band that I would like to have at some point in my life and you know, apart from that I've just always wanted to really do a lot of like charity work because in India there are a lot of stray dogs and they don't get enough care they don't get enough food and especially during the rain rainy season like now there are a lot of dogs just you know dying in the rain so oh, wow. no food and because of diseases and stuff and they don't have homes so i would love to invest in a place where i can have like a dog a resort or something where sure. they can where i can adopt them and have people take care of them and stuff hopefully one day there you go there you go well and if people want to stay on top of what you're doing where's the best places to look so you can follow me on instagram at dey underscore b a double s mm -hmm. at daybase on instagram i'm very active on instagram I'm very active on youtube and that's just you can type mohini there and it'll just pop up and on facebook i'm not very active on facebook but i do share whatever i share on instagram on facebook so yeah i'm you can i'm not on twitter i'm not on snapchat i'm not on tiktok so mm -hmm. don't find me there only facebook instagram and youtube very cool. Well, Moe, we appreciate you taking time from your busy schedule to chat with us. We're looking very much forward to all of your future projects and all of the great music that you'll continue to bring us. And it's so exciting because it lets us, from our point of view here in the United States, to have some insight into the music where you're coming from, which is just Thank you. very exciting. And now I'm going to bring my world into L.A. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, folks. You've seen her here. Moini Day on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you.